Continuing on with our series looking at combined anatomy and physiology with movement being our central reference point or the central point of our network of meaning or the central point of our semantic network, we're looking at thoracic extension. Now, when looking at thoracic flexion, we already went through the bony structure very generally of the thorax. So we discussed ribs and thoracic vertebrae. Uh, not necessarily uh, one specific thing about the thoracic vertebrae. So the thoracic vertebrae, the facets are kind of multi-planar, so they are somewhat in, bete in between planes, so they do allow for some degree of side bending and rotation with respect to the facets themselves. Now the ribs do get in the way, so that limit or that motion is limited to some degree, and then if you look at them, <clears throat> they will allow for flexion extension as well, because again, they're somewhat in between all of the cardinal planes, so the motion is available there. However, based on the ribs, based on the fact that the, at least with thoracic flexion, it's mostly really torso flexion, you're getting a fair amount of torso extension when you're talking about thoracic extension as well. However, because there are muscles directly on the vertebrae, as we'll discuss, thoracic extension is a little bit more about vertebral extension, generally speaking, than it is about torso extension. So we will get into our main objectives here after the preamble. So our main objectives are a specific discussion of what thoracic extension is, again, planes and axes, so we want to be clear about those. There's a lot of repetition with respect to planes and axes when we're talking about these movements, and that is very much on purpose. We're going to have a general discussion of the muscles that extend the thorax, a general discussion of the nerves that supply the muscles of thoracic extension, a general discussion of vascular supply, especially to those muscles, a general discussion of the heart, and a general discussion of areas to assess and treat should thoracic extension issues should be should be suspected or reported by the patient. Uh, again, as we go through, there's a strong tendency to talk about the areas to assess and treat, but we will make sure that we're clear about that at the end. So again, talking about planes, sagittal plane is a 50% cut of the body left to right. Uh, so the axes being perpendicular to the plane, you have a uh, sagittal plane, horizontal or transverse axis. So at 90, at 90 degrees, the horizontal or transverse plane is a 50% cut of the body top to bottom. So you have a horizontal or transverse axis with a vertical or sorry, plane with a vertical axis. The frontal plane is a 50% cut of the body back to front. So you have uh, the frontal plane or the, or the coronal plane rather uh, on an AP or PAA axis. So with respect to thoracic extension, it is in the sagittal plane on a transverse or horizontal axis. So it is backward bending in the sagittal plane. So, and again, on a, a transverse axis, and translation being movement directly across a plane, so there's no axes, it's just movement directly across a plane, does not necessarily occur, at least within the vertebral region or the vertebral column. It's almost all rotatory motion because it's about an axis, but keeping in mind that when we talk about flexion, extension, side bending, and rotation, we have the term rotation, so we don't necessarily call flexion forward rotation in the sagittal plane, we tend to call it just flexion or forward bending. So in the case of extension, again, just to make it very clear, it is backward bending in the, the sagittal plane on a transverse axis or a horizontal axis. So the muscles of thoracic extension, generally speaking, you're talking about the erector mass. So iliocostalis, uh, spinalis, and longissimus, right? So you have iliocostalis lumborum to some degree attaching into the, the thoracic column. So that's going to be at least a mild contributor. contributor. You have iliocostalis thoracis, you have longissimus thoracis and spinalis thoracis. Those are your large muscles that are likely to do most of the, the work for extension. You then have your deeper muscles or your interspinal muscles. So you have intertransversare, interspinalis, multifidus, and rotatories. These are much smaller muscles. They are less likely to be large contributors to vertebral extension, but they will contribute to some degree. There is some reason to believe that they are at least in some sense more reflexive in their contraction. So they're more about stabilizing than they are creating general motion. However, that's not absolutely the case. So an argument can be had there, but for the sake of discussion, you would consider them with respect to vertebral extension. So you would consider those deeper interspinal or intervertebral muscles as part of the movers. Now, as far as the, the sensation around the vertebral column, as well as motor innervation to the muscles 
attached to the vertebral column, you're almost always talking about the dorsal primary rami or the posterior primary rami of a mixed spinal nerve. So it's going to come out of the the vertebral column, it's going to synapse and kind of go back around. Uh, so the if you look at the the diagram, it's actually the back of the body is on the bottom. So you're seeing that coming out and going backwards into the vertebral muscle. So in, in this case, it would be into the erector mass, the, and that's going to be your motor innervation. So almost any time we talk about extension, we're going to be talking about muscles of the vertebral column, be it in the cervical region, thoracic region, the lumbar region, and we're going to consistently talk about the dorsal primary rami because that is motor to the muscles of the vertebral column, as well as sensory essentially along the vertebral column. So that stays quite stable. As far as vasculature to the, specifically to the vertebral muscles, you're getting that within the thoracic region off of the posterior intercostal artery. So you have the descending aorta or the thoracic aorta. You can interchange the terms, but usually you're going to, you're actually going to hear both relatively often, so they are somewhat interchangeable, but the posterior intercostal arteries come directly off of the, the aorta within the thorax, directly anterior to the vertebral column or the thoracic vertebrae, and then it's shooting off these branches that are going to run uh, kind of superior in the intercostal space. So it's going to be, if I remember correctly, it's vein, ar vein artery nerve, so the intercostal nerve is usually below the artery and the intercostal vein is above the artery, but you can see that sending off branches looping back towards the actual vertebrae and looping back towards the muscles of the vertebral column. So in the thoracic region, iliocostalis, spinalis, and longissimus, as well as the deep vertebral muscles, so multifidus rotatoris and interspinalis and intertransversari, are going to get arterial supply off of the posterior intercostal arteries, and then the venous drainage is going to be off of the posterior intercostal veins, and that is going to go into the azygous system. So those intercostal arteries are going to dump into the azygous vein. So on the right side, it's the azygous vein from the whole way, and on the left, it is uh, on the top, it is the accessory hemiazygous, and on the bottom, it's the azygous vein. So that's going to carry that towards the superior vena cava. So the terminal drainage point for that system is a superior vena cava going into the right atrium. Now, as far as the heart is concerned, so to have a discussion of the heart, we want to first look at the covering and how it's attached to the body wall, which is the pericardium. So the pericardium essentially wraps the heart up, so it keeps it away from other things. It kind of isolates it, it suspends it, uh, and then it also allows it some movement within the pericardium. So you have the uh, the visceral pericardium and the parietal uh, pericardium. I believe that's the proper term. I may be incorrect there, but the pericardium nonetheless is going to attach uh, to some posterior portion of the sternum, sometimes as high as the manubrium. So it's the superior pericardial ligament. The then you're going to have varying attachments in, in some people, but then what you're really looking at is the xiphopericardial ligaments and then the uh, phrenopericardial ligaments. So the pericardium attaches directly to the diaphragm. So as the diaphragm descends, it actually changes the position of the heart and also stretches it a little bit. So it changes some of the dynamics of the heart, which is one of the reasons why you'll have heart rate variability, because with the breath, the shape of the heart changes, the tension of the heart changes. So it changes the ability of the heart to contract mildly. So you should actually see changes in heart rate with respiration. And it's primarily because of the mechanical tension generated from the movement of the diaphragm because it connect, the pericardium connects to the diaphragm and also envelops the heart. As far as, as far as the heart's concerned, so we'll just do a general talk about the uh, the movement of blood through the heart as well as the electrical conduction system. So the movement of blood whether it's from the inferior vena cava or the superior vena cava, it's going to go into the right atrium. It will then go into the right ventricle. So when it goes into the right ventricle, it will exit and go into the pulmonary veins because, or sorry, my apologies, the pulmonary arteries. The pulmonary arteries are going to take deoxygenated blood that's coming through the right side of the heart to the lungs for gas exchange. At the lungs, the gas exchange occurs, and then arterial blood or arterial blood that is loaded with uh, appropriate levels of gas, primarily oxygen, is going to come back to the heart, to the pulmonary veins. So this is the one time when arterial blood is in a vein. 
So it comes back to the heart through the pulmonary veins, goes into the left atrium, and then goes into the left ventricle. Uh, it is then pumped out of the left ventricle to the ascending aorta. Now on uh, when the, the valve close, when the valve closes, as the blood is pumped out and the valve closes, essentially what you'll have is backflow of arterial blood to the coronary artery. So the heart is essentially the first place, the coronary artery is the first place that really received blood, but it's once the, the valve closes, you get backflow. After that, it's going through the aortic arch. As it goes down to the, you'll have some blood go to the head and then it's going to go into the thoracic or the descending aorta. You're just going to see the posterior intercostal arteries at that point. So that's your very, very, very superficial overview of blood flow through the heart. Now we're going to talk very, very superficially again about the electrical conduction system. So the electrical conduction system you have, uh, so if you look at number one, that is the atrioventricular, or sorry, the sinoatrial node. It's in the atrial sinus and it's in the right atrium. So the, the signals that are going to generate contraction of the heart are going to first hit the SA node. It's going to propagate through the atrium towards the AV node, the atrioventricular node. The atrioventricular node's primary job is to actually create a delay in signal. So it's not straight propagation of electrical signal to allow for contraction of the heart. So it creates a minor delay now that delay, so initially you get the, the atrium contracting, right? And then that minor delay in contraction so that the ventricle doesn't contract immediately after allows the ventricle to stay relaxed. So the atrium contracts, pushes blood into the ventricle and the AV node slows down the electrical signal. So then it goes through the Purkinje fibers. And then at that point, it's going to propagate through the ventricles, which will pump blood out of the heart, whether it's on the right or the left. So if it's on the right, it's going to go to the lung. If it's on the left, it's going to go to systemic circulation. But the SA node receives a signal. The AV node slows it down. The Purkinje fibers propagate it to the rest of the heart, uh, essentially through the atrial wall or the path primarily being through the atrial wall. So again, very, very superficial overview there, but you do have a delay so an initial electrical signal mechanism and then a delay mechanism to allow for coordinated contraction of the atria, then the ventricles to allow the movement of the blood. The cardiac plexus is what is going to innervate the heart muscle itself as far as contraction is concerned, so controlling rate, so increasing rate or decreasing rate. The cardiac plexus is going to be made from sympathetic fibers that originate in the thoracic region so the the thoracic re the thoracic region of the spinal cord and its outflow now some of those fibers are going to go up to the cervical ganglia so superior cervical ganglia middle cervical ganglia inferior cervical ganglia and then descend along somewhat similar to the, to the path of the vagus nerve because the vagus nerve is going to be the parasympathetic so the sympathetic fibers will technically more or less speed the heart rate up the sympathetic fibers will essentially inhibit that signal so it allows it to slow down so the sympathetic fibers can be sending signals but the the vagus generally if memory serves properly inhibits that so in essence it doesn't necessarily slow it down but it slows down the signal if if memory serves properly but the cardiac plexus is the vagus nerve in combination with the the neural fibers or the postganglionic the preganglionic fibers are from the thoracic region the postganglionic fibers are in the from the cervical ganglia and they descend and that's what's going to innervate the heart as far as uh, heart rate is concerned or contraction is concerned now the or the phrenic nerve c3 c4 c5 sorry c yeah c3 c4 c5 is usually termed as the phrenic nerve, which is motor to the diaphragm. However, it is also sometimes termed the pericardiophrenic nerve because it does inter innervate, I believe in a sensory sense, uh, on some level, the pericardium. Uh, there may be some other job, but the phrenic nerve is actually sometimes termed the pericardiophrenic nerve because it does provide innervation to the pericardium. Now, as far as areas of consideration for assessment and treatment. Again, because this is in the thoracic region, you want to consider the ribs and the T-spine broadly. So the way to know if you have an extension problem or you have, not necessarily a problem, but you have a, a thoracic region that prefers extension is you have to flex it. So the assessment is the opposite movement, at least within the osteopathic world, because osteopathy tends, or osteopathic diagnostics tend to term something for its preference, for what it likes to do. So if something does this, 
and not and doesn't go that well so to to this side so it side bends left well and it doesn't side bend right particularly well side bending left is the diagnosis so if it something extends well and flexes well you don't have a diagnosis in the sagittal plane because it does its job in both directions however it extends well and doesn't flex well or as expected you would call it extended so the way to prove your prediction is that something is extended you have to flex it to prove that it will not do that so that's something to be aware of consistently across all osteopathic diagnostic terms or osteopathic diagnostic behavior but as far as the region you're going to consider the ribs and the t-spine broadly speaking so as a result of the actual motion of extension in the thoracic region being generated directly on the vertebral column with the muscles that do it you're going to be much more focused on those right so if it will extend and it has a problem flexing so that is your classic extension you would want to do inner intervene with the vertebral muscular musculature in the erector mass because you're going to have a hard time actually palpating in any way the deeper muscles or the intervertebral muscles because they're hidden so you're going to interact primarily with the erector spinae or erector, erector spinae however you prefer to say it and then you're going to consider the ribs because if there is some challenge with rib excursion then that can impact the mo movement of the region you're going to want to be careful of known or suspected fractures or tears so if there's a known or suspected or recent trauma with respect to the vertebral column in the thoracic region or the the ribs so the thorax or the torso itself you're going to be one you're going to want to be very careful doing anything with that because as you move it you can cause some trouble so in cases if there's recent trauma you're a little bit more likely to want to consider patient active methodologies uh, any concerns with tears it's very unlikely that you're going to have a tear to the erector mass or a tear to intercostal muscles but if you have some reason to suspect it you obviously want to be careful because if you move it you may tear it more uh, known or suspected aneurysm so as was said in the thoracic flexion presentation a thoracic aneurysm or an aneurysm within the thoracic aorta or any portion of it so the ascending uh, the aorta the aortic arch or the arch of the aorta or the descending or thoracic aorta you're not going to have any real good signal as a hands-on practitioner that there would be an aneurysm there. But if there is some symptom that the patient reports or some sign that a physician notes that causes essentially imaging of the thoracic cavity, then an aneurysm may be noted. If an aneurysm is noted, you want to be very, very careful there because as you start to twist, twist and pull and tug in the region or put pressure up in the region, you run the risk of causing changes in pressure, which could cause challenges to the weakened wall of the aorta as it passes through the thorax. So you want to be really careful with that. So again, very generally, you're considering the ribs and the T-spine themselves. You're considering especially the erector mass. Uh, if there are known or suspected fractures or tears, be very careful. Any reason to suspect aortic aneurysms, especially thoracic ones, you really want to be exceedingly careful or not do anything.